In both our Sunday morning and Sunday evening services after today, we will be running this series on the Epistle of James, the very practical book of the New Testament. And this morning our subject is the entrance exams to God's university. The entrance exams to God's university. The book of James has been compared to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. Both of them emphasize the practical aspect. The learning experience for the child of God is the emphasis in both of these books. The book of Proverbs is not just a series of Proverbs that are strung together like beads on a string. Rather, there is a story that is told. There is, first of all, the appeal to the young man as he begins life to enroll in the school of wisdom, God's school. And we find that the young man matriculates in the school. And actually, we have the ringing of the bell, and the classes begin. And you see the development of the course as it goes through the book of Proverbs. Now, the epistle to James follows very much the same pattern. James enrolls the child of God in the university of God. There are entrance exams to be taken, and these entrance exams are not easy. The fact of the matter is they are very difficult. It's a hard hurdle to clear. The lessons, first of all, are contrary to the thinking of the natural man. The natural man, the unsaved man, with his natural mind, he could never qualify for this exam. This is a book written to believers, and you must be a believer to take these exams. And since the bell is rung, and we have the opening chapel, and Dean James is ready to give his first lecture, I think we ought to be present and listen to what he has to say. And you'll notice the thing that he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now that's the reading of our translation. I have here, and if you'll pardon me while I get it, the translation of the Amplified Version, which I'd like very much to read at this point. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, and it has greeting, but it also says that the literal rendering is rejoice. And that is the important word. That is the warm word of welcome that James gives to believers as they enter the university of God. By the way, that university has another name. It's sometimes called the University of Hard Knocks. It's God's university. And in it, he says, rejoice. That is the key in many ways the overtone and the undertone of this book that we have here. Now, because this morning most of you that are believers here, you are a candidate for a degree in God's university. And somebody says, well, what field will I get my degree in? Well, there's only one field that's covered in this university, and the subject is made very clear. I heard a liberal lecture many years ago giving the Cole Lectures at Vanderbilt University. And in that, he was speaking on the Epistle of James, and he said that the themes of James was works, that that was the theme, works, good works, and that James actually wrote to contradict and to correct Paul the Apostle. For Paul had written and emphasized justification by faith apart from works, 
And James wrote to correct him. Well, now, in the first place, James could not have written to correct Paul for the very simple reason that James is the first book that's been written in the New Testament. So James could not have written to correct Paul. If there's any correcting to be done, Paul would have done that. And then, may I say this to you this morning, because the general conception is that the epistle of James has as its theme works. The theme of the epistle of James is not works at all. The theme of the epistle of James is faith. I trust that even this morning, as we get into this epistle, we'll see that. It's the same theme that Paul has. And what James is saying is from a different viewpoint, but it's the same theme, and he's looking at the subject, the same subject, from a different viewpoint. He says that faith produces works. And when James discusses works, he's not talking about the works of the law, he's talking about the works of faith. Or, let's put it like this, both Paul and James are talking about the same thing. Paul talks about the root, and the root is faith. And James discusses the fruit, and the fruit is the fruit of faith, if you please, and the works of faith. Therefore, the major that you have in the university of God is faith. God teaches his own faith. Save by faith. We grow by faith. We live by faith. And we die by faith. The child of God enters the moment that he trusts Christ. He enters a life of faith. And that is the great theme God wants to teach us in his university. Now again, I'm going to refer to this amplified translation. And will you notice as we get down now and listen to this first lecture of Dean James in the university. He says, Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, when you are enveloped or encounter trials of any sort and fall into various temptations. Be assured and understand that the trial and the proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience. Now that amplifies the translation, but it does bring out the thing that James is saying here. Now, therefore, it's not strange, therefore, to find out that the theme here is faith. He talks about the testing or the trial of your faith. That is the theme now he'll be discussing. Now the question arises, because we are hearing today so much to the contrary, is the Christian to experience joy in depth in all the trials, troubles, and tensions of this life? It may seem strange what I'm going to say just now, but I think I have James on my side of this question. The answer that I would give, if I may be permitted to give an answer, is no. And that's not what James is saying. There is one thing today that leads to unreality, is to hear Christians today putting up a front when troubles come to them, and especially at the time of death, and they say, oh, I'm reconciled to the will of God. I bow before him, I accept it. And of course, you have to. But the important thing is, down in their heart there is that rebellion. And they're not really reconciled to God at all, but they say that. May I say they are trying to put up a front, they're trying to carry through that which they feel that a Christian should do. May I say to you that we're never asked to say that which is not really from the heart at all. Actually, that leads to an unreality, and it leads to that which is humbug in the Christian faith. 
You know it's a form of insanity to adopt that which is a pseudo-pious attitude today toward the problems and the tragedies of life that come to us. It always reminds me of the man who was in a mental institution and a visitor there noticed that he had a baseball bat and he was beating himself on the head with it. And he went up to him and he said, Why in the world do you do that? Well, he says, It feels so good when I quit. May I say to you that there are a lot of Christians today that seem to operate just that way. Trouble is not given to us for trouble's sake. Trouble is never an end in and of itself. God just doesn't test us just to be testing us. There is always a reason for it. Now he says, count it all joy. And that's the internal attitude of the heart. And the aorist tense, and if I may be technical a moment, suggests that the joy is the result of the trial, not the trial in and of itself. This idea today that there's something joyful in the trials and tragedies of life, that's not true. But they come to us in order to bring joy into our hearts and our lives. The writer to the Hebrews makes the mind of God very clear in the twelfth chapter of Hebrews, verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. And isn't that the truth? No chastening, and this is child training, that's the word, it's the discipline of a child. And no child training seemeth to be joyous when you're going through it. That's a form of insanity to say that you're enjoying the trouble that you're having. Now, I do know some folk who enjoy bad health. You listen to them. They really enjoy it. And they can tell you all about their troubles. But again, that is an abnormal viewpoint. Now he says, nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And putting it now together, now no chastening, for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. It's exactly what it is. It's a tragedy. It's trouble. There are trials. There are problems. There are tensions. And there's no use saying, I'm enjoying these, because we're not enjoying them unless we're abnormal. He says to us then, nevertheless, Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Therefore, trials are meaningless, suffering is senseless, testing is irrational, unless there is some good purpose served by them and a sound reason for them. Now, when the external pressures of testing are upon us, we are placed in the fires of adversity, or calamity, or tragedy, or suffering, or disappointment, or heartbreak, then the internal attitude of faith is that God has permitted this for a purpose. And it's a high and lofty goal that God has in view, and he intends to work this out in our lives for that which will be good. Now, that doesn't mean that we can understand the purpose. The fact of the matter is, I'm of opinion we will not understand. This is the test of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight, and this is one of the tests of faith. Now, this morning, I'd like to suggest some of the purposes that are served in the testing of faith. Has God put down for us today certain guidelines that give us an inclination, at least, an idea of why he permits trouble to come, why he tests his saints today, why he puts them into the fires of suffering? Well, I'm going to mention three this morning. The first one is this. 
the testing of faith is proof positive of a genuine faith. When your faith is tested, then you'll know whether it's genuine or not. You notice how he began this? Knowing this, that the testing of your faith, the two participles, knowing and testing, does it that you might know. Let me illustrate. Out here at one of these aircraft plants, one of the engineers in the designing department he comes up with a new design of a plane. It's put on the drawing board, and they have a skull session, and those in the upper brass meet together and look over the plan. It looks good. Then blueprints are drawn. Then a model is made of the plan, and then construction begins out in the plant. Two years goes by from the beginning of that first drawing down to the time that the first plane rolls off the assembly line, and that's where it stops, because then they roll that plane out on a runway. There's a test pilot that is standing by, and there's a question. There's a question about this one they tested over in Fort Worth the other day. Will it fly? Will it perform in the way that they thought it would perform? Will it stand the test? Well, the pilot goes into the cockpit. He sits down. He warms the plane up. He takes it down to the end of the runway, and that's the moment. And then it starts down the runway. It takes off. It goes into the blue, and then he puts it through its paces. It stands the test. And then he lands. They have confidence now in the plane. They begin to produce it. It's given to these airplane companies. And before long, passengers enter the plane. Now it's been tested. It's been proven. My friend, may I say to you, genuine faith must be tested. God permits our faith to be tested. Why? To prove whether it's genuine or not. Another illustration. Up here in one of these mining towns, there is an assayer, he's called. A man comes in today with some ore. He says, I dug this out of my diggings up here. I think it's gold, or I think it's silver. He gives it to the assayer. The assayer takes it and he puts it in that little clay bowl that he has and puts it over a Bunsen burner and he heats it red hot. Then he takes it and he pours acid on it. Then he beats it. Then he says to the man, this is genuine ore. This is the real article. It looked like it before but now we know it's the real article. And he declares it's genuine. God tests faith to prove that which is genuine. Someone put it like this, the acid of grief tests the coin of belief. That's true. And you'll find that our Lord encountered this same sort of a problem when he began his ministry. We're in the Gospel of John. When he first began, first time to Jerusalem, honestly, I would have been taken in. He was not, for he was never taken in. But it says in the second chapter of John's Gospel, verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, I'm glad it says many believed, for the very simple reason, if it had been one of our modern evangelists, he'd have given you the number. Just here, it's just many believed. And I say, hallelujah, this would be a nice report to make it to congregational meeting. But listen to this. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, 
for he knew what was in man. You mean to tell me that he suspected them? He surely did. It wasn't genuine faith. There came a time of testing for them, by the way, and over in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, I read this in verse 64. But there are some of you, our Lord is speaking now, that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They couldn't stand the test, you see. And they went back. Remember, our Lord turned to his own disciples, the twelve, and he asked them the question, Will you all so go? And they did not go. However, Peter answering for them, You have the words of eternal life. They were genuine. Now again, let's look at this testing of faith that God gives. God called a little shepherd boy by the name of David. That little shepherd boy went through a great deal of testing in fact, I know of no man that was ever tested quite like David was tested. When David became an old man and he's sitting in the palace, I think he said right at the end of his career, it was before his death, as he sat in the palace, he thought back over his life and he remembered when he was a little shepherd boy out yonder on the hills of Bethlehem. Then he looked at his life. He saw how God had led him. And that's when he wrote Psalm 23. It is a man that has been tested who wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He never wrote that as a theological professor who knows nothing about life. He never wrote that as some inexperienced man. He wrote that as a man who has had his faith tested in the fires of adversity. Paul the Apostle was another man that was really tested. fact of the matter is, he was told when he was called that he was to be tested. The Lord Jesus said, I've called him for two reasons. One reason is, he's to be my witness to the Gentiles. The second thing is, I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, the reason for that is so that when Paul wrote, nobody since then could stand up and nobody here could honestly, truly stand up and say, well, it's all right for Paul to say to rejoice, but if he had to live in Los Angeles where I do and go through what I go through, he couldn't say that. Well, I don't know what you're going through, but whatever you are going through is nothing compared to what he went through. His faith was tested, and when he wrote the epistle to the Galatians, he said this, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. As a man that's been tested, that he's no young theological professor who is raising questions about the inspiration of Scripture and raising questions about life today and the reality of the Christian faith. Here is a man that knows. And God, my friend, if your faith is genuine, will test you to prove that your faith is genuine. Now we have today our churches filled with shallow and superficial saints. Why? Never been tested. I have been reading a book this past week of a theological professor. He's a brilliant fellow. He does some of the neatest tricks on a mental trapeze that I think I've seen. Very clever. But you can't read his book without sensing that he has a feeling of insecurity. You know why? His faith has never been tested. I know his background. He was the son of wealthy parents. 
he has never had to endure one bit of testing. And honestly, he doesn't know whether his faith is genuine or not for the simple reason he can put it through all kinds of mental gymnastics and make it perform like a trained elephant. The only trouble of it is faith is not a trained elephant, nor is it lived out on a mental trapeze. It must walk the streets. It must live in Los Angeles. It must do that in order to be real, my beloved. Therefore, faith must be tested, and God tests faith, if you please. And we are hearing today from this new intellectual group. They question the Word of God. They raise all kinds of questions today, and they feel that they must deal with these problems today. Why? They've never been tested. When your faith has been tested, then you don't argue about it, my beloved. You know. That man, after he has taken his oa to the assayer, and it's been put in the fire, the acid has been poured on it, and it's been beaten, do you think he'd waste five minutes arguing with anybody whether his oa was genuine or not? He knows. Genuine. And he knows it's genuine because the test has been made. We're hearing today a great deal about what they call the new morality. Why? You know why we're hearing about the new morality? What's wrong with the old morality? The thing wrong with it, it never was tested. It's too bad those that are talking about the new morality don't try the old morality and see whether it works or not. May I say to you today, my beloved, this thing needs to be brought out of the ideal atmosphere and out of space and brought down to the streets where we live and move and have our being. God says, taste of the Lord and see if he's good. This thing has to be tested and God wants it tested in our lives. That's one of the reasons that he gives us this entrance exam of suffering or of tragedy or of permitting us to be tested in many, many different ways. Now let me move on. There is a second reason and purpose in the testing of faith. It produces patience in the life. May I go back to these two verses? Be assured and understand that the trial and proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience, but let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play and do a thorough work so that you may be people perfectly and fully developed with no defects, that is, lacking in nothing. Now, patience today is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. God never gives patience to a person as a gift. It always comes, not even by trying, you can't try to be patient. Patience comes through suffering and testing, and that's the only way that any person can ever become patient. Have you ever noticed these folk today, many dear saints that have been on beds of pain and sickness for years, how patient they are and how long-suffering they are. And then some of us that have not had to go through that, how impatient they are. I sat out there at that medical clinic waiting for an x-ray. Oh, I think I sat there for 45 minutes. And I got up and I went over and I said to the girl, I said, what's the matter? She said to me, just be patient. <laughs> oh, my beloved, may I say to you, it's suffering today that produces patience. It comes through suffering. It comes through testing. And we can never be a perfect. And the word perfect doesn't mean perfect as we think of it. It means complete. It means full maturation, a full orb personality. And we can never be that without having patience. 
And that's the reason some Christians, they just never grow up. They always remain babies. Would you mind if I said this this morning to you? You'll forgive me, I trust, for saying it. But did you know there are more babies in this auditorium than there are down in the nursery? I mean spiritual babes. Now there's a difference. The difference is the babies down in the nursery are pretty. They're beautiful. Why today among the saints do we have the clamoring and criticizing in our churches today? This is a day of turmoil and trouble and tension. And somebody says, oh, if we could only get rid of it. Well, my friend, it's part of the discipline of life. That's the way God's testing us today. And he's testing us that we might grow up. Will you listen to David again? Over in the 131st Psalm, he says something quite interesting. He says, surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Now that's what trouble and testing did for David. Have you ever noticed a baby when it's being weaned, how fretful it is, wanting to get back to the bottle? And then there comes the day when finally the baby is weaned and given solid food, and then it becomes satisfied with solid food. There are a lot of spiritual babes today, and they still want the bottle. And when God begins to wean them and take the bottle away from them and begins to give them the good solid food of testing, they become very fretful. What's God doing? He's attempting to bring us to the place where David came. David says, I'm now a weaned child. I today have quieted my spirit like a weaned child. I don't fret and cry all the time for the bottle. What about you today? My Christian friend today, are you still on the bottle? And is God today trying to wean you and you're having a little trouble and you're having problems and difficulties and tensions and today you're fretting under it all? He's trying to produce, if you please, he's trying to produce patience in your life and my life. And you know that's the most difficult thing in the world to produce in our lives. Now, Paul said the same thing. Paul and James never were in conflict. Paul says in the fifth chapter of Romans, listen to him. And not only so, but we joy in trouble also, knowing that trouble worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now, that's what you call a domino reaction. A great many people say, oh, Lord, make me patient. And God sends them trouble. And they said, Lord, I didn't ask for trouble. I asked for patience. And he said, that's what I'm doing. I'm making you patient. I'm sending you trouble. And the domino reaction is like this. God sends us trouble so that we learn patience. And then patience produces hope, and then hope produces love, and the love of God, and this is not our love for God, but God's love for us, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And my friend, until we learn patience, we'll never be sure of the love of God in our hearts. Now, again, may I be personal. During the past 17 years here at the Church of the Open Door, I've had opportunity to observe the spiritual growth of many saints, and that's been one of the joys of this ministry. This man won't mind it. He's sitting here today. When I came here, he was a real baby. He was loud, noisy, and critical. Oh, how difficult he was. He told me that. Then trouble came. And I mean trouble. He passed through deep waters. 
One day he came into my study and he told me something of his problem. And my friend, he had a problem that many of you know nothing about. None of us know. I've never faced it. He seemed crushed for a time. And I watched him. Slowly he made a comeback. And this morning he's one of the most stable and strong believers. He's a joy to a pastor. I would risk my reputation of that man today. Oh, what a choice saint he is. What's happened? God tested his faith. And it was genuine. I come to the third and the last this morning. There's another purpose in God sending trials to us. It presents a program for the future. I turn down to read verse 12 in this first chapter. Blessed. And then the other word is happy. For the word blessed, it means to be happy. Happy is the man who is patient under trial and stands up under temptation. For when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Now, testing of any sort, especially if it's severe, if it's some calamity or tragedy, something sudden that comes to a person. I was with a man when the announcement was made of the death of his son. I think the man would have gone crazy in that moment, and he did something that may sound to you very strange, but he got up and the minute it was announced to him, he got up, he went over to the wall, and there was a picture, he straightened it up. He says, I've been intending to straighten that up a long time. You know what he was doing? He was getting his mind off of that, which would have absolutely tripped him. When trouble comes to us, it has a tendency of producing a miasma of pessimism and hopelessness. The man of the world today sinks beneath the waves of adversity. Even life at its best today makes many people pessimistic. The unhappiest people in the world are your Hollywood crowd. There is right now an epidemic of suicides among teenagers. A commentator made the statement this week. He says, during the Depression, there were no suicides. Young people had no chance at all, but they had a will to live. But today, everything's given to them, and they want to die. May I say to you, my beloved, there is today something about life for the natural man that produces a pessimism. No hope. No future. When faith is tested and you're surrounded by darkness and the waves roll high over your little bark and all seems lost, the child of God knows But this is not the end. He can say, if all were easy, if all were bright, where would the cross be? Where would the fight? But in the hard place, God gives to you chances for proving what he can do. And again, let me pass this on. Pressed out of measure and pressed to all length. Pressed so intensely it seems beyond strength. Pressed in the body and pressed in the soul. Pressed in the mind till the dark surges roll. Pressure by foes. Pressure by friends. Pressure on pressure till life nearly ends. Blessed pressure. Pressed into knowing no helper but God. Pressed into loving the staff and the rod. Pressed into liberty where nothing clings. Pressed into faith for impossible things. Pressed into living a life in the Lord. Pressed into living a Christ life out 
cord. That's what it'll do for the child of God. He knows, as the psalmist says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And he tells us that there is a crown of life for those who stand the tests of life. Now, don't misunderstand. This is not the crown of eternal life. This is not eternal life at all. That's the gift of God through faith in Christ. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ. You don't work for that. That doesn't come through testing. But if you are a child of God, God tests your faith. And God has promised that he will give a crown of life, which is a reward for those who will stand the test, those who, through the experience, learn to love him. Will you notice what he says in Revelation, the second chapter, verse 10? Now he's speaking to believers. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have trouble ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life, a reward, if you please. There's a danger of a believer losing a crown of life, not his salvation, you never lose that, but you can lose the reward. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. God tests us, my beloved, for a purpose, a definite purpose. It's not meaningless, it's not senseless. I read this past week the story of Albert Weiner, a Jew in Germany. Hitler murdered his mother and two sisters. His father had been a prominent insurance man, had died before. They died in Buchenwald, concentration camp. This man before that, though, had enlisted in the French Foreign Legion because he'd lived a very sinful life. He'd gotten in trouble in Germany. When he was out of the French Foreign Legion, he was in Marseille in France, and the Gestapo arrested him there because he was a Jew. That was in 1944. He was put in the Drusi concentration camp. There were 105,000 Jews in that camp. There were only 1,400 survivors. He was one of them. After the war, he went back into Alsace. He began a business. In fact, the matter is, he invented something that would have made him an immensely wealthy man. But because of the circumstance at that time, why, he lost everything. And he became very much discouraged. He emigrated to Canada, where his sister, another sister, had gone. And when he got there, he met reverse after reverse, disappointment after disappointment, and he planned suicide. In fact, he set the date, April the 9th, 1961. I'm not going to all the details, as I haven't told his entire story anyway, but may I say to you that he took one last chance. He went to see a preacher, a Baptist preacher in Canada. He said, do you have anything to say to a man that'll be dead in 24 hours? And he did. He ridiculed this man. The preacher said, let me pray for you. And he ridiculed him for him. He says, you can pray. And while he prayed, he ridiculed him and blasphemed. But he said, when I left, some of the scriptures he gave me struck my heart just like a sword. I didn't commit suicide in 24 hours. I went back in 24 hours. And I came to know Christ as my Savior. And now I know, he says, why God put me through the fire. My friend, that man today will not argue with you about 
the inspiration of the scripture or the hypostatical union of the virgin birth. He knows his faith has been tested. You cannot escape suffering. Trials and troubles are going to come to you. I don't care who you are here today, saved or unsaved. Those listening to me, you'll have trials and troubles. Job says man is born unto trouble as sparks fly upward, and they don't fly any other direction. And man has nothing but trouble in this life. The pagan world tells that the two oldest pieces of sculpture that have come down from the pagan world, the ancient world, and they're famous, they tell their story. The first one is the dying gladiator. He has around his neck that which indicates he came from Gaul. He's a barbarian, one of our ancestors probably, from up in Germany or France, brought down to Rome and put in the amphitheater to satisfy the inhumanity of a Roman populace that has absolutely become dehumanized just as the Nazis were, and just as any people who give up God. And there's that dying gladiator, those tremendous muscles of his. He couldn't stand up against the opposition. My friend, this world today will see to it that you're going to have trouble. This world is not your friend. The other sculptor is the Laocoon group. You've seen it. The two boys of the priests yonder at the city of Troy. These serpents were sent as a curse upon them, and they've got these two boys entwined. The father, the priest, wanted to deliver his sons, and he went down to deliver them. But he, too, got in the message of the serpents, and all three were killed. My beloved, you cannot cope with the troubles and problems of this life. They'll get you. There is only one. He says, in the world ye shall have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ today is the answer for your troubles, for your sorrows, for your trials. You cannot bear your burdens alone. He'll bear them for you. He'll take your burden of sin. He'll give you a deliverance and a freedom if you come to him. Then when he tests you, he'll prove you're genuine. He will see to that. He said, ye did not choose me, I chose you. He'll see to it that you'll stand the test. Shall we pray? With our heads bowed this morning, are you here today with a burden, with a problem? Are you in the darkness? Are you trying to battle life alone today? No wonder so many people go to the top of the roof and jump off. Young student at Stanford, Stanford hasn't anything to offer anyone to keep them off of the roof. Science hasn't today. Pleasure hasn't anything to keep you off of the roof today. But Jesus Christ can save you. Multitudes have come to him with their burden of sin. Save them. 
And then he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest for your soul. He promises that to you today. I'm wondering if you here are listening in this morning. You've never trusted him. You have your burden, your problem today and this morning. You'd like to say, preacher, pray for me. I'd like this morning to have him bear my burden, my sin, my suffering, my disappointment, my sorrow. Our gracious, loving Father God, we truly thank Thee this morning for a Savior who came down, bore our burden of sin, that which was too heavy for us, and said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. We do pray for these who've lifted their hands, they may bring that burden today and put it at the foot of the cross. And we pray for any others that are in this auditorium are listening in today that are carrying that burden that's so heavy. May they turn to him, for we pray in his name. Amen.